My name is David Emmanuel Noll, and this is another Oki Magazine interview. Today I'm joined by Francis Ann Solomon, director, producer, writer, and founder of the Caribbean Tales Media Group. Firstly, can we start by you? You were born. You were born in England, uh, of Trinidadian parents, uh, raised and educated in the Caribbean, uh, and then moved to Canada, uh, and then moved back to Britain to establish a successful career in the 80s and 90s as a producer and an uh, executive producer, uh, a drama producer and executive producer. Um, tell us, how, how did you get into the, into the industry? Um, well, first of all, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, but in the 80s, I was um, I came to England and I uh, was I was approached by a woman called Jocelyn Barrow, who's a British uh, activist broadcaster. At that time, it was just after the riots, um, the, the the riots in London, Handsworth across the country. But, um, and uh, they were there was a, a reckoning going on in the country. It was the mid eighties. They were looking for the BBC was looking for, um, you know, <clears throat> uh, accomplished people to, to to join the corporation. And she, I, I recently discovered that she did this with a number of people. She actually headhunted. Jocelyn was on the board of directors of the BBC at the time. She was the first black member of the board of directors of the BBC and she actually headhunted a number of people and brought them into the corporation. A lot of people, you know, it was like, let's get this moving right now. Um, so I got a job at Ebony, which was the B again, the BBC's first black magazine program. Um, my background up till that point had been in, in, in drama. I was a theater person. I had written and directed in the theater uh, at university and then afterwards. Um, <clears throat> so I'd also worked actually uh, with Banyan Productions in Trinidad, which was a television company in Trinidad. So I had I had experience of working in television. Um, and in Paris, I'd worked with a production company in Paris. But this was a big leap um, and transfer of my skills to a new forum. I'd never been a reporter before. I'd never worked on current affairs. And then, um, and it, it, was, it was quite the education by fire, to be honest. And then um, after that, I was um, accepted onto what was then called the BBC drum, the BBC training program, production training program, which was a two-year program where you spent three months each in, you know, different departments. I was in local radio, I was in drama, I was in um, <clears throat> in news and current affairs, and 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 so on. Um, and then after that, I got a job. Um, I got a job with uh, a channel four, channel four with. Um, on, there was a there was an incredible black magazine program that was uh, led by Darkus Howe and Tariq Ali called the Bandung File, which was um, which which did like one hour in depth documentaries about 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 um, black and third world issues, um, and that was also incredibly formative for me. Uh, that was the first time I got a chance to direct in television. Um, and then after that, I got a job at the BBC again as a radio drama producer for three years, um, where I produced radio dramas and then um, as a script editor and then producer and executive producer in BBC television drama. So that's how I got into the industry. Um, it was an incredible time. Actually, in the night, in the, in the, in the late 80s and 90s, there were a lot of opportunities for people like me. Um, you know, there really was an opening. And then what was really shocking was that at the end of the 90s, it all shut down, right. which is a real kind of um, cautionary tale for what we're going through now. Because I feel that multiculturalism or diversity you know, came to an end at the end of the 90s. And has only just begun to open up again. Um, 
I, I mean, I, I suppose working in the industry, this is probably you know a question that's been posed to you several times. Um, and bearing in mind, you just said about that sort of period of the eighties and nineties and that rush to, to change things, so to speak. Would you say then, therefore, um, that the industry overall, from your experience, has changed that much? Bearing in mind, it's sort of stopped or staggered in terms of any sort of progression, um, yeah, particularly in light of you know various campaigns, things like Me Too, um, you know, the, 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 the whitewashing of, of, of Hollywood, etc. Do you think those things have resonated enough for, for having any sort of progressive change, or is it just simply you know minimal, marginal changes? I think changes happened in the last year since the murder of George Floyd. Right. It seems like it was a tipping point where finally, um, you know, it was like all of a sudden the dam broke. And um, for the first time, I saw white people actually getting it, you know. And I think I have to think that this is different. It can't go back to what it was before. But it was horrendous the way that between about the late 90s and almost last year, although there was some small, very, t I mean, there was some tiny opening happening from around 2015, 2016, with, like you said, the, the, the um, Oscar So White big movements began to be made to diversify the academy. Um, but, you know, as, as, as a general movement, it really nothing changed until the middle of last year. And then all of a sudden, things seem to, to flip over. Mm. 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 Okay. Well, uh, and I do think, I do think it's a different, it's a completely different moment now. You know, there are opportunities, there are discussions, there are transformations going on in industries that I do not believe, can, I cannot believe are reversible because of the fundamental nature of the changes that are going on. Having said that, parallel to that, you're seeing this rise in white nationalism, rise in, um, you know, dictatorships around the world. Um, and... Um, you know, that is also terrifying. It's very mm -hmm. sobering. Mm -hmm. um, so while, you know, generally liberal institutions are, you know, taking up the challenge of transformation in a, in a, in a substantive way, you're also seeing this rise of violent white mm -hmm. extremism, you know? I guess that also um, illustrates the... The responsibility and power of filmmakers and filmmaking in terms of how, um, without being um, politicizing or, or being politi political by default, um, you, you are in some respects being able to combat and challenge them, those sort of um, uh, lenses in which people are actually viewing the world, in which people are, are looking at politics, looking at societal issues. So. I suppose um, uh, it, is, it is an empowering period in which you know, filmmakers and artists in general can, can hopefully influence. influence. I think so. I think, it's, yeah. it's a, I think, I think this, is, this is a moment, but I'm not sure how much we can influence those who are not, you know, already. We're preaching to the choir in a way because I'm not sure what effect we're having on the other half of the population. You know, it's sure. literally a 50-50 split everywhere, you know? Mm. So it, it's very disturbing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, hopefully, as I say, it's um, it, it, the influence of uh, individuals like yourself will, will power through, um, fingers crossed. <laughs> fingers um, crossed. Fingers crossed. Uh, with regards to your own career, I mean, you've, you've, you've won many prestigious awards. You've... Um, uh, you've got lots of accolades. What would you say to date has been, I don't know, your most proudest achievement and why? I don't think there's any one proud achievement because, um, you know, whatever I'm working on at the time seems, you know, really takes over my my mind. And I'm very proud of, of what I accomplished just because I work really, really hard and I enjoy what I do. You know, I enjoy... Um, the stories that I'm able to tell um, and sharing those with audiences. So 
I wouldn't say it's one, it's one thing, you know, um, I can't really say that. So whether, you know, I go back in time and talk about, you know, my career at the BBC, um, you know, I'm proud of a lot of the things that I did there um, from bringing on, you know, black staff and crew and opening, you know, the door to many people who at the time, you know, to producing shows that I'm still proud of, you know, mm -hmm. um, to working as an independent and uh, studying Caribbean tales. I'm incredibly proud of Caribbean tales. I'm incredibly proud of the films that I've been able to make. So, um, you know, I, I really have um, had the privilege of being able to, to work in, to do work that I'm proud of, you know, and and I I feel that when I die, I'll be able to look back and say, you know, that I I'm happy, you know, I've, I've, that I'm satisfied with, with the way it went. Yeah. So you've you've left your legacy. I don't know about sure. the legacy bit because who knows what will survive you, you know, yeah. very little for most of us. But I feel like along the way, yeah. I'm pleased with I'm happy, you know, and satisfied. Good. Yeah. Good, good. And regarding your work, can you tell us more about your, your recent project, uh, Hero? So Hero was a project that um, he, Ulrich Cross, who the film is about, was a friend of my family. Um, he was, you know, Uncle Ulrich to me. He, I knew him as um, an older gentleman, very, you know, respected, and who had served in the Second World War. Um, as the most um, decorated um, uh, navigator in the RAF. So that was his reputation even there, even when he was alive. Um, and my, it was my mom and her friend Desmond Allen who, who, who really wanted to make this film and they were trying to make this, get this film made. And eventually um, when Desmond died, um, I decided to help my mother. So that's how I got involved. And then the more research I did about Ulrich, the more I realized that this was a story that I wanted to tell. Here was this man who had been born and raised in England, in Trinidad, and who went to England, served in the war. And then after the war, he was recruited by George Padmore, another Trinidadian, to go to Ghana um, to help with the, um, with the liberation process. Um, right. on independence. Ghana was the first um, African country that became independent in 1957. So here was a story that, that, that joined the Caribbean and Africa um, in the 50s in a way that I think a lot of people don't know the role mm -hmm. of, of, of the Caribbean, the way that the kind of pivotal um, role that Caribbean intellectuals and professionals played in the African liberation movements. And the way that it was like a call went out at that moment in time, you know, hmm. to bring people from the African diaspora back to help, to decolonize, to, to bring independence to the African continent. And there was a dream of a United States of Africa, you know, hmm. that, that, was, that was being hatched and that was subsequently undermined and destroyed by the by the um, by the colonial powers and America because they had a vested, vested interest in Africa remaining the kind of feeding ground of the you know it's the most um, it's the most um, resource wealthy continent on the planet. There are more diamonds, gold, you know, and all kinds of other, you know precious minerals in Africa than anywhere else. So they had no desire or intention of allowing that wealth to go to Africa. It was propping up Europe. It was feeding America. So, so they destroyed the way that the way that the colonial powers destroyed the dream of African independence and autonomy and wealth, I thought was an important story for people to know. Sure. That, sure. About sure. this dream that once there was a shining dream and mm -hmm. that that it was destroyed. So, sure. and the film is available on on stream on demand. Yeah, oh. it, we've now got it on Showtime um, in the US, on Amazon in the US, on Amazon in the UK, and in Canada on on Cineplex. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So please, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, great. And I mean that that but again, you're 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 as a filmmaker, you're in the position of uh, providing a, a different narrative to so many mm -hmm. of stories that need to be told, and that sort of segues quite well into into the Caribbean Tales TV um, and, and the media group overall. I mean, can you tell us um, more about the origins of the formation of, of Caribbean Tales Media Group? So in the, you know, I left the BBC. It was an incredible experience, actually, because here you had this organization that developed, produced, marketed, and sold content to a rapt audience, which is British audiences, you know. And being involved in that machine, that kind of story-making machine, um, to, it wasn't a commercial, it wasn't a lowest common denominator commercial organization. It was very much, the mandate was to inform, to educate and entertain, you know. So it had a public service, it was a public service mandate. Um, it was really a great place to come of age and learn your craft. Um, and see something that really worked well, a brand that by being local became global. You know, BBC is a very highly, received, but primarily it, 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 it serves a British public, right? It, it serves the interests and tastes and it's a very, it's a very, it's got a very tight relationship with British audiences, right? And the television and radio is, these are like family members. For English people, do you know what I mean? As well as to people all over the world. Um, so having that model in mind, uh, but they, of course, the only thing they didn't do really well was serve people of color. You know, uh, to, they didn't do a good job of telling our story. So I really wanted to um, have an organization that would, you know, deliver that pipeline of creation, production, marketing, and sales. Right. Um, but that would do that with our stories um, that would have as its point of departure, cent central place, a Caribbean narrative. You know, and the Caribbean is just as much of an extraordinary diaspora as the British Empire, to be honest, because people came from all over the world to Britain, to the Caribbean. You know, they came from Europe, all kinds of European countries, different languages, from Africa. Um, they were brought from Africa, from India, from, you know, from, from Palestine from um, different, you know, Jewish people, Chinese people came in waves. You had these waves on waves of immigration, very rich. So, and then Caribbean people have gone everywhere. You know, everywhere you go, you find, you know, communities of Trinidadians and Jamaicans, um, whether it's in Europe, Africa, China, you know, they, they come. So, so the diaspora is very, is very global. So I wanted to, um, sorry about that. I wanted uh -huh. to... <laughs> I wanted to. Um, they did. I've got something to say. Yeah, they do. Somebody's coming. <laughs> and um, yeah, and and so that's what we did. We we develop content and we produce content, and then we also um, exhibit content through the festivals. And we have three festivals. I'm terribly sorry. And we also have um, a distribution sales outlet because it's important for content to be sustainable. So um, that's what we've done, and um, and that's why that's the origin. Yeah. So I mean, in terms of um, obviously you provide a, you know, a, um, various platforms. You also um, uh, have a, a, a directors uh, seat, and have a monthly sort of directors um, talk where you're talking to filmmakers, and uh, so there's also that sort of educational. Uh, camaraderie amongst filmmakers that you provide um, is that uh, I mean again that's presumably that's very well received by by, um, by by stakeholders by people who are following Caribbean Tales uh, I, I hope so thank you yeah, <laughs> yeah. well I mean I, I've, I've looked at uh, you know some of the videos and um, I find very interesting. I mean, the, the, your your guests, the, what you talk about, your experiences, your you know, exchanging notes, and I think that that's something that um, many people need to see because it's not just purely just the 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 end product, but it's also the, the process in which you deliver that that form of art. Um, so it, it is sort of again a whole sort of supply chain of activity for people to be exposed to 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 know how 
these things are, are formed and, and what it takes and what struggles, if, if any, are, are behind the scenes in terms of developing programs and projects that for particularly underrepresented groups. So, um, I mean, I think that's highly commendable and I, you know, I just look forward to further further episodes. It's some it's a monthly thing, isn't it? So in the, uh, the director's chair, yeah, it's monthly. Yeah, 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 we also have yeah. a global uh, global networking where we bring together um, industry practitioners from around the world to talk mm. about um, their their different perspectives. Yeah, I mean, I think we have. It's important for us as to create as creators to to connect and also to connect with our audiences. You know, over the years. Um, there, there's a great hunger in mm-hmm. Black and Caribbean um, diaspora communities to see their stories on screen, to connect, to to to, to connect with. Feel, I feel one thing that I've learned over the time is is about um, you know Black audiences all over the world that there is a way in which we all we are connected. You know, it may mm-hmm. not that when you're in Trinidad that you're connected with. Ghana, for example, but sure. now, especially with the pandemic um, and having had to make this um, pivot to the to the digital world, we're getting audiences from everywhere, and mm. those discussions are really um, vital and mm. connected. And also, like traveling with um, with Hero, which was a film that we shot in Trinidad. In England, in Ghana, and in and in Canada, um, you know, it was really interesting screening it for audiences in all those different places because everybody, you know, we are so connected without mm-hmm. really realizing it. You know, many mm-hmm. of our stories interconnect. Um, would you say? Would you say the stories or experiences? Um, whilst I, I one would. Have, presume that they are slightly you know different in terms of different perspectives American perspective or the European perspective from your experiences and your dialogue with filmmakers and audiences would you say that there are any distinct differences or uh, expectations or um, that sort of come to mind in terms of um, filmmaking or even the narratives and stories that they want to want to capture are there any things that are are quite distinct and different from 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 each continent of dias of the diaspora. Well, I mean, definitely. Like, there's even differences between audiences. What audiences want to see in Trinidad and Jamaica? You can't really get a Jamaican to look at a show that comes out of Trinidad. <laughs> <laughs> That's really really hard to do. Okay, <laughs> because they. Very caught up, like every. <laughs> where we get Brits to look at stuff, like there's this assumption and a reality that that um that you know there's this cultural differences, you know, and also rivalry and competition, you know, between oh. Belgians. Oh. I don't know where you're from, but Belgians and Trinidadians, and Jamaicans, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah. And then, you know, Ghanaians and Africans and Caribbean people are over here, mm-hmm. Africans are over there, and you're not going to get any. And then Brits, who are they? And then, you know, Americans who think they're better, but, you know, right. go to Africa right. and get put in their place. You know, so there are all these assumptions about difference, you know? So it's really, really gratifying to have a film like Hero, which is actually about you know, this man who came from one place and went to another place, went mm-hmm. to England, then went to Africa. And we mm-hmm. shot it in those places and involved people, you know, actors and crew and stuff from those places because I wanted it to be authentic to those places. You know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah. and so, and so, and then screening it in those places and having people in those places see themselves in it, you know, mm-hmm. is has just been, because of the assumptions about the way in which we are separated, have been forcibly separated and yes. and are now separated 400 years on you know right. um it's it, it's enough it's it, 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 it's very very emotional to travel mm. with a film like that and have audiences everywhere be touched you know so that trinidadian audiences obviously get it because guy was from trinidad there are other Trinidadians who had experiences that were similar. And then in England, you know, the whole 
thing, you know, because he, you know, the whole col- British colonial thing is very strong. And so a lot mm. of British got it, you know, really appreciated it. But then to show it in Ghana and have people say, yeah, my uncle was a Caribbean. I remember this person. or And actually having African people say, I didn't know you cared. You know, like Nigerian people, you know, say, you know, um, what a number of African people say, what I took away from it most was that we didn't know that you people over there actually cared about us. You know, we thought you left us. And then, yeah, it was very moving. And then screening it in America, where, you know, they're like, yeah, I remember that. I was, you know, that was like, because a lot of people in the 60s and 70s and 80s were involved in the Pan-African movement, you know, and so saw themselves in it. So um, it was really, it was really, yeah, we can talk about hip hop and we can talk, that also talk about, um, you know, the, the, the cultural differences. But then if you go deeper, there's so much that connects us, you know. Yeah. And ultimately, it all goes back to that journey mm. from Africa that, you know, whether you were there or you were taken away, that it was a trauma that has not been healed that continues to resonate through our stories and our experiences. Mm like that to tell a story about Caribbean people who returned to help you know like a boomerang yes. you know yeah. who returned to help with the liberation that they were you know that they, these people were taken away in you know forcibly survived the journey mm. that each and every one of us that came back is a blood relative of somebody who left yeah yeah who left yeah. forcibly and that we're back now and we're here to help. It's very, very moving. Yeah, very moving, very powerful. And and in in terms of again, uh, you kind of you know answered the questions in terms of the the, the differences, but there's also a, a, a um, some sort of method in terms of selecting films for the process of the, the festival. So, I mean, you've got this uh, the the Sinfam. Um, and uh, the Windrush um, festivals forthcoming. Um, what what can audiences expect in terms of the type of um, films and the documentaries that uh, are programmed for this for this for this festival season? So we have three festivals. Um, Caribbean Tales is our is our oldest festival. is our sixteenth year, and you know with Caribbean Tales we try to tell. St- um, stories from the Caribbean um, that that resonate with the Caribbean, whether they're from the Caribbean or from the diaspora, um, that are you know that reflect the kind of incredible diversity of our experiences. You know that no, we have so many Caribbean stories to tell. You know, there's no one story. You know, um, so whether it's a comedy, a tragedy, a, you know, documentary, with whatever the subject matter, but really that. That um, that speaks to the Caribbean experience at some, um, or resonates with Caribbean people, and then the other, and then Cinefam was created five years ago to re- to tell the stories of women of color, and so that's what we do. You know, we really it's an international network. We 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 because our funding comes from Canada, we focus a lot on Canadian um, mm-hmm. films by Canadian women, mm-hmm. and you know because as a woman of color. I feel like one of the things that we've had to um, fight against is just visibility. You know, <laughs> for so many years we were just invisible, but just you know, giving a spotlight to to women, to women of color filmmakers, especially as directors. You know, there's this kind of resistance to put, even though women make people, right? <laughs> <laughs> like maybe because women make people, they have the power to make people. It's really important that they never have creative power. So it's like acknowledging the creative power of women. Oh my goodness, I've got this drill going on here. But anyway, I hope it's not too much. No, and no, then, no. Well, yeah, and then Windrush has been this new project that I've just started since um, Hero. We um, when I took Hero to England, it, it was so successful. I was able to build 
um, a network. In order to distribute it, I worked with dozens of organizations around Britain, uh, community organizations. And after the after the uh, release, uh, we had uh, we we continued working together. And so that's what's become the Windrush Caribbean Film Festival to show stories that celebrate the contributions of the Windrush generation. And this year we're focusing on carnival, so carnival arts, um, carn calypso writing, um, stick fighting, all the different arts of the carnival. Um, okay. Yeah, so, and it's cool. discussions and films. and So it's very great. <laughs> well, no, well, I'm looking forward to it. I mean, I know that uh, a, lot of, a lot of the industry has been uh, obviously affected by, by COVID. Uh, and a lot of things are, are virtual, but uh, it's good to know that things haven't stopped completely, and that you're still moving forward with with, with the festival. So, uh, congratulations and best wishes on that. Um, and in terms of um, further information, uh, where can uh, our viewers receive further information? Um, so, Caribbean Tales, CaribbeanFestival dot com. Um, then Windrush, windrushfilmfestival.com. And that's going to be our first festival up. And then Cinefam is cinefam.ca. Great, great. Okay, well, thank you for that. And we will make sure that uh, we will try our hardest to um, help promote and celebrate uh, the festival and all your activities moving forward. So uh, thank you very much, Francis. Anne.